panel is going to stay with me. I want to bring in 2024 Republican presidential candidate. He had a busy day, busy night. Vivek Ramaswamy. Vivek, uh, thanks for joining us. As you see the scene right now, um, uh, the, the coverage with the drones and the uh, chased uh, SUVs of Donald Trump being brought to Fulton County Courthouse to be fingerprinted, he has mugshot taken, and the left thinks this is the ultimate in humiliation. Uh, your reaction tonight? I think this is shameful, Laura. This is an indictment, not of Donald Trump, but of our national civic health, that we have gotten to a place where we have a party in power that will use any charge in any jurisdiction for at the same time in the middle of an election designed, mark my words, to stop their lead political rival currently from running. And I'm saying this coming out of a debate last night that went really well in many national polls. I'm now in second. It would be easier for me. If my competitor in this primary, Donald Trump, were eliminated from competition, but that is not how I want to win. That is not grounded in principle. We are skating on thin ice as a country right now, Laura. And I think this takes us one step further in the wrong direction. We have to stand on the side of principle, not politics. That goes for everybody in this GOP primary. And I've been vocal for a reason. Vivek, you said you're one of the candidates who uh, would support Trump uh, as the nominee if he wins the nomination, but if he's convicted of uh, a crime. Here's how former uh, governor of Maryland, Larry Hogan, reacted to this. Watch. That was the low light uh, of the entire debate. I mean, I was uh, embarrassed and disgusted by it. For, you know, six people to raise their hand and say, I would put a convicted felon in the White House, it, it, it's just uh, beyond comprehension. I mean, in, in most states, convicted felons don't even have the right to vote. They, they're not registered voters, but we would put them in the White House. The establishment didn't like uh, the rallying around Donald Trump because they don't like the views of Donald Trump or certainly not yours or DeSantis's. I think the reality is we're rallying behind the founding vision of the United States of America. That the people who we elect to run the government ought to be the ones who run the government, not the deep state, and certainly not somebody selected by the administrative police state, which is the way they're trying to run the show today. And so I have a simple view. The person who leads this country next should be the person who the citizens of this nation actually choose. I think that's not a radical idea, yet it seems radical to the likes of not only Joe Biden, but look at our own party. Liz Cheney to Chris Christie to Asa Hutchison to you know, Larry Hogan or, or whoever else you're going to play from the traditional Republican establishment echoing the same talking points. And that's why, Laura, I think the divide in this country goes even deeper than just traditional Republicans and Democrats. I think the real divide is, do we believe in the founding ideal of this country, of the American Revolution, that the people can be trusted to self-govern? Or do we actually believe that the people can't be trusted and it has to be a small group of self-appointed quasi-monarchs in the back of palace halls in old world England in the old world, but in the administrative state as it goes today? I stand on the side of the American Revolution. That's why I'm in this race. I do not think we're in a moment for incremental reform. I think we require a revival of the ideals of 1776 itself. Uh, that's what my campaign's a... about, but that's yeah. also what we need to revive in this moment. Uh, people want to talk about a political revival. We need a spiritual revival in our country as well. But you, know, yes. you wouldn't be elected to do that. All right. Um, a lot of your political opponents are flooding the marketplace with Vivek, uh, you know, negative research on your background. I've got to ask you some of these questions because I frankly don't know the answers. Sure. But you, you have been, in my view, excellent on China. You've been very tough on China in your campaign. Um, but it, it, when you I think it was back in 2018, you were you, you were CEO. You gave a, a keynote remarks at some biotech conference in China. Um, I know you've you've done business in China yeah. and you've partnered with with various yes. companies that have uh, ties to China. Uh, do you have a That's is there a transcript of that? Those remarks that you gave at that biotech conference? Would you release the video yeah, you, you, uh, of the speech there? Uh, absolutely. Absolutely. In fact, there's nothing to hide. Far from it. I write about that experience in Woke Inc., my first book, Laura. And the fact is, I probably know more about the modern Chinese, Chinese state than probably everybody else on that debate stage yesterday. Because, yes, I have done deals around the world developing medicines in many jurisdictions, not just China. But here's what I know through my own experience. China is different. 
The CCP does not allow you to do business in China unless you effectively meet their demands. And that's why they turn American CEOs from Jamie Dimon to Tim Cook to Larry Fink into the CCP's circus monkeys. And so the reason I am so vocal against actually our need for economic independence from China, Laura, is based on my own views as somebody who actually has not been in state government for my whole life, but actually has been in business, understands how this game is played. China wants to turn U.S. companies into pawns to do their bidding. That is why they require Airbnb, for example, to hand over American user data as a condition for doing business in China. That is not capitalism. That is Chinese mercantilism. And that's why I have been the most aggressive in this race, based on my own personal understanding of it, that we have to say that unless China plays by the same set of rules, we're I mean, you you made a lot of money in China, though, right? I mean, you made... I actually did not there. make a lot of money in China. Uh, I made it. I actually did not. Um, so <laughs> for, for better or worse, the reality is the way I made money was five FDA approved drugs here in the United States. The climate over the last decade actually but are changed they made in, in China. China? So are any of those drugs? Are any of those no, drugs made not. in China? They're not made in China. Oh, actually. thank God, because they're everything not, else actually. is. And, and yeah. in fact, in my late days, in my late days as CEO, I began the pull out from China. And so Royvent, that the biotech company I founded, as far as I know today, I'm not part of the company anymore, doesn't have operations in China. But also, when I founded Strive, the competitor to BlackRock that I founded, I made a day one commitment based on my own knowledge that that. Strive would never do business in China. And and Strive would never do business in China, unlike BlackRock. Exactly. Um, Exactly. And uh, And I think it's so important that we see the Chinese threat. Clear clear up the the Soros scholarship you got. I don't know. That was way back in 2011. But you did get some scholarship from that was sponsored by, you know, the Soros Foundation. And because you needed, uh, you yeah, needed the money, or, I mean, what was that It's all come about? up a million times. <laughs> yeah, so when I was 24, I applied for a generic scholarship that hundreds of people win. 24 years old to go to law school, graduate student applications, generic scholarship from not George Soros. And this is the common misconception. It is a family member of George Soros who is long dead at the age of 24 to pay for law school. I'll tell you this, Laura, anybody who would have turned that scholarship down at the age of 24, if they're the same person today, should get nowhere near the White House doing trade deals on behalf of this country. And so the reality is they probably aren't very happy with what I say today, but no tie to George Soros other than condemning him. And let's just be really honest. I mean, Donald Trump, who I love and respect, had a $160 million loan from George Soros. That's not disqualifying. Ron DeSantis has been complimented by George Soros countless times in this campaign. Investment partners hosting fundraisers for DeSantis. I don't think that's disqualifying either. But I do think it's good people are asking questions. That's what a primary process is all about, and I embrace it. Look, Vivek, nobody knows, who, you know, nobody knows who you were five minutes ago. I knew you just because of your book. Yeah. And you, you, we've done so many interviews yeah. over the years. So I've I've known you, but our viewers are still getting to know you. And yet you're, you know, number two or number three in these polls. Washington Post put you at, at uh, finishing second behind DeSantis last night. But you and DeSantis combined are 55 percent. All six of the other candidates on stage together combined didn't beat you and DeSantis. That's pretty stunning. Well, I think the debate was really useful last night because it smokes out some real ideological differences in the GOP. And that's going to make the party stronger. That's going to make the country stronger. And so I think that that was a successful evening. And and the reality for me, Laura, is that even though we had some what it will call banter on the basketball court last night, I still view the other people on that stage as colleagues in our national revival. I expect to be the next president. I expect to win in a landslide. But I will require respectfully each of those people to play their respective roles in our national revival as well in some way, because this is a team sport. And you brought this up earlier. It's not the job of the U.S. president to to automatically bring back faith in the country. But I do think it's an important point to pause on where the left feeds our vacuum of purpose with race, gender, sexuality, climate. And I do think we as conservatives need to now level up. So we're not just criticizing that agenda but offer an actual vision of our own, individual, family, nation, God. I'm leading the way on that, but I'm going to need the other people on that stage to play their part in our revival, too. Vivek, we got to get get back to the Trump chase here, but um, thank you for joining us. All right, joining us now is former Deputy Independent...